Today, we're going to talk about automating your mailbox, getting your email client to reduce your typing, automate your mail handling, and generally make your inbox a more workable space. Now, my examples come from Outlook because that's the program that I use. But if you use MailSpring or Thunderbird or any of the other common clients, these capabilities are available to you. They might be called by slightly different names. But the important thing is to know that they can do it so you know to go and ask and look up what that command might be. If you're like me, you get a ton of mail, and just trying to get it organized so you know what you need to do is a huge task. And most of us start by shuffling that mail off into folders so we can get it organized. And what we think we're doing is this. We're getting it all neat and tidy so that we can work with the one thing we need to work with. But what we're actually achieving is usually this. We're just putting it off in a corner where it's easier to ignore, easier to overlook. If you look at those folders on the left side of your mail client, you probably have 15 folders with a dozen unread emails or 100 unread emails. We haven't actually fixed the problem. We just shuffled it off into 15 other locations where it feels like it's smaller, but it's actually more scattered and harder to address. Now, the funny thing about it is if you actually look at it, the intended use of these resources is right in front of us. We just never paid any attention. If I put these objects in your office as physical things, you'd use them totally differently. This is the way those resources are designed to be used. If we need to keep something once we're done with it, we put it in a filing cabinet. We put it in folders off to the side where we can get it again later. The stuff we're working with stays in our inbox and on our desk. The problem with that, of course, is that we have a million emails, and we need a little bit more organization than throwing them in a box on top of the desk. What we really need is an inbox that does this. Now, a lot of our mail clients can approximate that using tags or labels. With a quick click, you can identify a message and sort of put it in a group, and then you can click a label or a tag to display just the things in that group. But sometimes we need a little bit more control than that. Our mail client on our desktop usually has the ability to give us more. This is my inbox. Instead of being grouped by date, today, yesterday, last week, which is the default for most mail clients, it's grouped by category. So I use those tags and labels, categories and Outlook, as a way to organize and group messages. And because they can have more than one category, they can be in more than one of these groups. I can find them at any given time without having to filter out the rest of my inbox. It's not a tough thing to set up. I just have to know that those are features I want to use together. I start with my categories, and then I tell my mail program to use that as its grouping mechanism. I don't know about you, but I have kind of a love-hate relationship with my autocorrect. It does some things I really appreciate and some things that really make me crazy. We get along a lot better once I took the time to get acquainted. This is the autocorrect for Microsoft Word and Outlook. Yours may look a little bit different. You've got a list of things I type and things autocorrect is going to replace that with. First thing to know is you can take stuff out of that list. The ones that autocorrect does to you instead of for you, those can go right out the window. The second thing you should know is you can add your own entries into this list. So that thing you type wrong every time, put it in the list and teach autocorrect to fix it for you. Third, and here's the one people don't always think about, is that stuff you have to type all the time that is just time consuming. You have a long company name. You belong to a law firm that's six different, different last names together. You can type an abbreviation into your autocorrect and have it type out the entire phrase for you. Long scientific terms, industry terms, phrases that you use over and over. Whatever that entry might be, you can train your autocorrect so that you can use shortcuts to get to it and cut down your typing time. Now, that's all good for words and phrases, but a lot of our wasted time comes in those messages that we type over and over again. The directions to the office, for example. Like most mail clients, Outlook has native template features. I like to use an add-in called My Templates because it gives me a few more capabilities. No matter what resource you're using, it'll look and work something like this. It'll give you a place to store those standard replies so that you can quickly insert them into any message. As you can see, my utility also allows me to store hyperlinks in some formatting. But the thing that chews up a bunch of our time is that message we send over and over that has just two or three things that need to change each time. For those kinds of messages, you can take advantage of your formatting capabilities. When this block of text gets inserted into a message, I have bright yellow indicators of where I need to change the text before I send it. If it's gotten yellow, it's not ready to send. So yes, there are always rules for success, but this time I'm not going to tell you what the rules are. I'm going to tell you that the rules are. Mail handling rules, that is. 
all that sorting stuff into folders, categories, or labels, your mail program can do a lot of that for you. You can tell it to look at messages when they arrive and ask questions about it. Is that message sent to me or am I just copied? Who's the sender? Are they in my contacts? Are they in my work contacts or my personal contacts? Is it a meeting request? Based on criteria like that, your mail program can automatically tag, categorize, delete, or route messages. It can do the same thing when you send messages. Now, most of us either save all of our sent messages in a sent messages folder, or we try to copy ourselves and then file messages. Either of these is very efficient. We don't actually need to keep everything, and there are some things that we need to make sure we keep whether we remember or not, and they should be with related messages, not just dumped into a big send items folder. Rules can check your messages when they go out as well as when they come in. Now, I've mentioned filing and categorizing mail. Your mailbox can also forward messages, redirect them, send them to someone else's mailbox as though that was their original destination. It can add action flags so that you'll be reminded to act on the message in X number of days, send a copy directly to your printer, or set up custom desktop alerts. Don't want to be notified about every last message, but you really need to know when a specific one comes in? Set up a custom alert based on the sender or the subject line, and you can get a custom notification when that specific message arrives. Another thing your rules can do for you is automatically add delivery receipts to some message. Now, notice that I said delivery receipts and not read receipts. A delivery receipt doesn't prompt the recipient to prove that they read your message. It just confirms to you that your message got past the spam filter and landed in that person's inbox where they can see it when they're ready without actually getting immediately in someone's face and insisting that they tell you right now that they've read your message. Now, one of the things that happens to us is all that mail we've filed sits there forever because nobody has time to go back and clean out every one of those folders one at a time. Your rules can add retention policies to your messages, telling your mail client how long to keep that message for you and letting it just automatically clean up when that time has elapsed. Finally, for every rule, there is an exception and your rules engine is no different. It will allow you to tell it if there are criteria or messages that you don't want this rule to apply to. One place that we commonly automate is with auto replies, our out of office message, for example. Those are great for general purposes, but rules-based replies will give you more control over exactly what's going out and to whom. Auto replies are sent only once. When you put that out of office message up, I'm going to email you. I'm going to get that the very first time. And when I email you again in three days, I'm not going to get anything. I just have to remember that your auto reply said you're out for two weeks. A rules-based reply is going to send me that message every time I send you a message that meets the criteria. So when I send you that initial inquiry on case number one, two, three, instead of getting your auto reply once and then sending you another message next week and just getting ignored. Every time I send you a message whose subject line is case number 123, I'm going to get that rules-based message that says, hey, I'm out of town. For business inquiries about case 123, route your message to Mary Smith. Rules-based messages can be more intelligent. Your auto-reply has two options. Send the same message to everyone or send one to internal and one to external people. A rules-based reply can be customized based on who it's being sent to, text in their original message, or any other criteria that you've included in your rule set. Do you have three different colleagues covering for you while you're gone? Have your rule check the email address of the sender, determine which client it is, and reply back to them with a CC to the appropriate colleague who's covering the account. Don't overlook the ability for your email to plan ahead for you. Need to send out a series of messages, a one month, a one week, and a one day reminder? Need to just take care of something while you're thinking of it, but the message actually needs to go out tomorrow? Delayed delivery lets you type your message now and tell your mailbox when it should go out. You can use this for timing business correspondence, or you can take that one quiet day, sit down, type out birthday reminders for every member of your team, and set them all to go out on the appropriate date. Never forget another birthday, even if you forget. This is also really handy for another important purpose. If you're working odd hours or catching up in the evenings or weekends, sometimes that involves having to send email to other people. However, 
emailing other people off hours tends to create that expectation that everyone's on duty 24-7. In some countries, they're protecting work-life balance by making it illegal for bosses to email staff outside of their regular work hours. Now, we all want to be respectful of someone else's family time and their need to recharge. We also kind of need to do the work when we can do the work. By delaying delivery, by setting a timer so that mail is delivered at the start of someone's workday instead of the middle of the night, we can do both of those things. There are also occasions where we send things out that have kind of a timeline on them. Hey, I have extra concert tickets. If you want them, I need to hear back from you within the next three hours. If I don't get to that message for four hours, there's pretty much no point in my reading it, right? You can set expirations on a message so that when that timer runs out, it'll show as expired in my mailbox. We've talked about managing the mail that you're working with, but there's also the mail that you're just keeping. Most of us over-retain mail. We keep huge stacks of stuff that we constantly have to wade through in the most vulnerable location of all of our data files, our email box. Most malware targets your email box. What's in there is the first thing that bad actors get a hold of, and we have more stuff in there that we've completely forgotten than we have anywhere else in our electronic closets. If you work for a big organization, your IT team archives your mail. They have everything. You only need to keep the things that you need to work with. If you work independently or in a smaller organization, rather than keeping everything in your mailbox, you can use tools like PST files and Google Takeout to move things out of your mailbox and into a format where it can be stored offline so you have it if it's needed, but it's not right out there in your day-to-day workspace. What you want in your mailbox is just the stuff that you're working with. That does leave one other side category of emails, and that's messages that are related to some other thing. They're messages that you want to keep because they're related to a customer, for example. The right place for those messages is in that customer's customer file, not in your mailbox. A year from now, if someone needs to know something about the history of that customer, they're going to go to that main customer file. They're not going to say, oh, by the way, did anyone check John's mailbox to see if there's anything about this customer in there? If you as an organization need to know it, put it in that customer's file. And when you do, please don't drag that message out of your mailbox and directly to the file system. Those .msg and .eml files are bad for you. They're bad for your computer. When you look at your files, you can see those are tiny little messages. What you don't see is the way that disks allocate space to those messages results in them using up about 20 times the disk capacity that they need. They fill up hard disks faster, and they slow down performance. If you're storing those little MSG files on a server, you're slowing the file server down for every person that uses it. And when you drag that message out to the file system, the file name is whatever the subject of the email was. Email subject lines often contain characters that are very difficult for file systems to process. That can be problematic in and of itself. If you need to save that individual message, print or save it to PDF, and give it a thoughtful file name that's going to help somebody else understand later what that message is and why you've kept it. Inside your mailbox, keep the stuff you need to keep in dedicated folders or in an archive. I occasionally come across folks who use deleted items as a filing space for things I might want back later. This has some downsides. First of all, that means all the stuff that you don't need is still there as well. Every time you search your mail, you're searching through all of it. Second, when you delete something from deleted items, there is a limited recoverability there, but not a lot. If you've put something in a client folder or in an archive folder and you delete it, it goes to deleted items. If you've made a mistake, you have a little bit more opportunity to get that message back. But probably the biggest hazard of storing things in your deleted items is the law of unintended consequences. We delete the spam. Some of the spam has horrible malicious links in it. Ideally, what we want is every time we close our mailbox to have our deleted items emptied so that those things go away. When we use our deleted items as a filing system, what happens is we search. Sometimes the messages that come back are those malicious messages that we intentionally deleted. It's really easy to accidentally click that wrong message, click that ugly link. You want the stuff that you want rid of to go away. For that reason alone, it's worth making sure that the only thing that's in your deleted items is stuff that you don't want anymore and that that trash bin gets emptied as often as possible. Now, 
elsewhere in your mailbox, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, there are things that you may want to keep for varying amounts of time. It may be that you keep all the files related to a customer for five years, but you keep certain other types of correspondence for one year. You can use retention policies to have your mailbox automatically manage some of those things for each folder. There's no magic here, just some common tools for making your mail program do a lot of the work that you've been doing by hand. The whole point of computers is to automate the simple and predictable work so that you can spend your time on the things that take that remarkable human brain to achieve. The things I've described will take some planning and some time to set up. And this has been Nixie Knows. Once invest, Thanks for spending time with you'll me today. Say, and if you learn something useful, not doing, please click the like so for an YouTube will be more likely to show someone else that something you. useful too. If you know exactly who needs to see it, click share. Make sure they get a chance to come spend a few minutes with me too.